Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, psychiatric conditions are very prevalent now, just like hypertension, diabetes. So in our day-to-day -day practices, you don't have to be a psychiatrist and you should not be a psychiatrist to treat the psychiatric conditions that would come your way. Uh, because depression is seen in one in five to ten in people and it's that common and particularly in the backdrop of um, COVID-19 this has increased so this is just an update as to how you will have to uh, what are the things that you'll have to consider when uh, treating a patient with a possible psychiatric illness and how to use your antidepressants uh, in this uh, non-psychiatric setting by non-clinicians because we will I mean every one of us will come across these patients that I'm talking about and these issues that I'm talking about so this is the case number one 45-year-old Mrs. A admitted to the medical ward following ingestion of 25 tablets of her anti-epileptic medications. She has been planning this act for uh, some time and she has, she has been to the general practitioner several times with difficulties in falling asleep for which she was prescribed alprozolam 0.5 in the night. She additionally had aches and pains of the body, lack of pleasure for several months, but what she actually told was only the difficulty in falling asleep. And uh, later, uh, it was revealed that the husband is consuming alcohol and he is physically abusive towards her. She was diagnosed of depression at the medical ward and was prescribed imipramine 25 milligrams in the night. Two months later, she develops a seizure. So um, you can put in the chat box, what is the diagnosis of Mrs. A? Adjustment disorder, depressive episode, acute stress reaction, dysthymia, generalized anxiety disorder. You can put the um, uh, answer in the chat box, we'll come into it later on. And how would imipramine contribute to the seizure? Is it by lowering the seizure threshold? Is it by hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, QT prolongation, or hypernatremia? You can choose several. For the initial one, there's only one answer. Here, it's true false. Then moving to the case now, scenario number two, 65-year-old Mr. B admitted to the surgical casualty ward with a hip fracture. And by day three of illness, he is unusually quiet was sleeping during the daytime and interacted very poorly with the staff, which the family members noticed as abnormal for him. And he has been otherwise healthy until this fracture. So what's the diagnosis? Depressive episode, delirium, adjustment disorder, dementia, or schizophrenia? You can put it on the chat box. And then what is the most appropriate medication? Is it intramuscular haloperidol, olanzapine, fluoxetine, clonazepam, or none of the above. Right, so with those two case scenarios in the mind, my objectives are outline the factors that we need to consider when we are prescribing psychotropics, and how do we use antidepressants, and how do we use antipsychotics. Let's discuss some common scenarios that we need to um, con consider. One thing is the diagnosis, because uh, among the patients who are presenting to the um, medical services, a lot of patients would not really tell you that they're depressed, unlike in the West. And it's very common, particularly among the patients with chronic illnesses like diabetes, pain syndromes. And there are some overlapping ideas, overlapping symptoms like pain symptoms, headache, poor sleep, which you need to uh, uh, carefully pick and choose. So there is underdiagnosis and also there is overdiagnosis. Now let's say a person comes to you with sadness following the death of the father. Sadness in that situation is appropriate. Just because the patient is sad, you cannot diagnose a depression. There has to, the patient has to meet the other uh, clinical criteria to, mark the di uh, to make the diagnosis. And if you treat this patient with an antidepressant, that's not justifiable. And as in the case that I presented in the 
uh, first case scenario, most resort to the symptomatic management. The patient comes to you with poor sleep, benzodiazepine is prescribed, whereas the patient end up getting dependent on the benzodiazepine because unless, um, unless in very, very rare situations, you wouldn't get primary insomnia in a patient. Most of the time, poor sleep is going to be a part of another uh, illness like anxiety or depression. Then the risk, we need to know, is there a risk to the patient? Is there a risk to the others? And is the patient not responding to my treatment? Is it a treatment resistant depression? Oh, complicated by other things like grief, which might need um, grief counseling in order for the patient to get out of this illness. So we need to have an idea about these things in order to know when to refer, to know whether this patient can be managed in the non-psychiatric setting. And one of the main important things in managing a patient with psychiatric illness is the psychosocial care. As in the first case, it's not enough treating the patient only, uh, it's not enough, uh, it's not enough tr uh, treating the patient only uh, because, uh, because uh, there was a, okay, right. So just treating the depression by prescribing fluoxetine is not going to be enough in the case of Mrs. A because there is domestic violence at home and the husband is using alcohol and most probably it's a common scenario in Sri Lankan setting, a husband who is, abusing alcohol to have morbid jealousy. So unless we take out those factors by providing the social support and getting down the husband and perhaps going to the level of the police to get a protection order, this patient's depression is not going to go away. And also, I have said psychological therapies. In certain instances, like let's say after a grief, patient has a depression and a grief. Depression can be treated by anyone, any doctor, by prescribing the antidepressant, but then you might have to tackle the grief, which is there, which might need a referral to psychiatric services because complicated grief can last for a long time and the depression will not get cured. Something that we need to keep in mind, what are the comorbidities and what are the medications is this patient having? Patients with diabetes are more prone to get depression and depressed patients tend to have that poor control in diabetes. And not only the medications will interact with each other, there is another thing that there are other medications, suitable medications which you could use so that a patient with rheumatoid arthritis might benefit by and additional assistance in reducing the pain, like for example, venlafaxine, because venlafaxine is good for pain syndromes as well. So let's know, let's identify what the differences of adjustment disorder, depressions and antidepressants, because if it is an adjustment disorder, you don't have to prescribe anything. I'll start with depression. If a person is feeling sad throughout, and there is loss of interest and enjoyment, reduced energy and decreased activity. Those are major criteria, along with reduced concentration, reduced self-esteem, pessimistic thoughts, disturbed sleep, appetite, which are minor criteria. We can diagnose depression. As I have mentioned here, there is mild depression, moderate depression, and severe depression. So I have given the criteria here. You have to have two major and three minor for it to be called moderate depression, whereas for a severe depression, it's three plus four. So adjustment disorder with cancer, but they are more gradual and they are uh, uh, prolonged. So there are several types, depressive, anxiety with disturbances, but these do not really meet the criteria that I mentioned about for about for it to be called a depressive episode. They're sort of sub-threshold. And these are as direct consequences of a stressor which is going on. And it wouldn't have arised if not for that cause, unlike in depression, where depression can occur biologically, endogenously, without a cause as well. 
So why do we need to know this? Antidepressants are not recommended for mild depressive episodes, adjustment disorders, acute stress reactions. They are recommended for moderate to severe depression and in dysthymia, which is uh, uh, depress depressive symptoms lasting for one, two, three years, because usually a depressive episode do not last for that. It gets worse or uh, it uh, tends to resolve on its own. So for a moderate depression, it's the SSRIs which are recommended, that is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And for severe depression, it's venlafaxine and the tricyclic antidepressants. Tricyclic antidepressants, they're slowly moving out of use, but those are the um, medications that are available. Right, so it's very, very important that we explain these things to the patients. The antidepressant action will co not come tomorrow or day after tomorrow after taking the tablet today. It will take about one to two weeks. Otherwise, the patient will go doctor shopping. And the side defects will be observed early, which is more likely nausea, dizziness, headache, sometimes some diarrhea. So if you educate the patient about it, the compliance will be more. And the other will you know, see the objective, uh, objective improvement before the patient sees the improvement him or herself. And usually it takes about four to six period, for four to six feet for the complete response to occur. And uh, you have to continue it for the appropriate duration. We have to tell that to the patient. Otherwise they think that just like the headache goes off and two paracetamols are uh, taken, after about one month, it's all right to stop the uh, antidepressant. For the first episodes, it's actually about six to nine months after complete resolution of symptoms. And we might, we have to emphasize on the discontinuation symptoms because patients will, if, I mean, most probably they will miss one or two doses and next day they would feel very terrible. So they might have symptoms like depression, agitation, headaches, dizziness, coming as discontinuation symptoms. They might interpret as depression coming back, whereas it's actually a discontinuation symptom. And as soon as you take the tablet or the antidepressant, it will go away. So you have to alert the patient to it. Otherwise, they get really scared and they might be coming to you running back. And also, sometimes if we don't know that, we tend to increase the doses. So these are the antidepressants that are available. Fluoxetine, sertraline, available in the garment sector. The others are available in the private sector. Venlafaxine is available in the garment sector. All the tricyclic antidepressants are available in the uh, government sector. And I have mentioned the uh, minimum therapeutic dose as well uh, next to it. Uh, when it comes to Venlafax, usually all these medications are administered once daily and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and in a Venlafaxine, duloxetine, they should be prescribed in the morning. Otherwise, the patient will develop insomnia. TCS in the night as single doses. Mertesapine, again, it causes drowsiness, so in the night as a single dose. Usually SSRIs are better tolerated. We have to be mindful about the gastrointestinal bleeding. Sertraline, paroxetine, fluoxetine, clomipramine, all are notorious to give rise to this. So I have put some evidence here. If the patient is on aspirin, warfarin, NSAIDs, there is a risk of gastrointestinal bleeding. So you have to prescribe a proton pump inhibitor. And sexual side effects are experienced by 70% of people who are taking antidepressant. You have to be very mindful. If they report of it, you might have to change the antidepressant to another. Hyponatremia, something we forget, particularly because when the patients present to us, they present with symptoms, vague symptoms, as if depressive symptoms. Please do a serum electrolyte. Uh, before they develop a seizure. And this is particularly common among the elderly and serotonin syndrome because of the interactions and if you overdose the patient. TCS are usually less tolerated because of the alpha adrenergic effects, the histamine effects, the anticholinergic effect. So a uh, dry mouth, constipation, hypotension, 
all these things are there apart from the risk of the cardiovascular system, lowering of seizure threshold and uh, uh, impairing the glucose um, levels of the body. The mind which we often overlook. SSRIs are notorious to cause interactions. The magnitude is dose uh, related and Examples, fluoxamine, it increases theophylline, paroxetine, potent inhibitor of cytochrome 2D6. It might lead to treatment failure with tamoxifen because the product is not converted to the active drug if you use paroxetine with tamoxifen. And there might be pharmacodynamic interactions like hypertension, patient might fall, have faintishness, and instances like tramadol they can lead to serotonin syndrome. These are some of the medications that can be used safely. Epilepsy, SSRIs are better, and escitalopram, citalopram, sertraline, less interactions. Fluoxetine, which we commonly use, better to avoid because it has a longer half-life and patients, if the patient develops any interaction or an adverse side effect, it takes about three weeks for it to get washed off. TCS increased the seizure risk. For the post-stroke depression, again, escitalopram, citalopram, uh, if on warfarin, or else you can use sertraline, escitalopram. Again, because of the risk that I mentioned earlier, fluoxetine, better to be avoided. Post-myocardial infarction, a lot of a significant patients, uh, a proportion of patients go into post stroke depression as high as 40 to 50%. And there, sertraline, mirtazapine has evidence. Again, you have to look for uh, interactions, enoxaparin, heparin, warfarin, whether there are interactions. You might need to take PT uh, prothrombin time monitoring regularly if you are compelled to use these medications. But prophylactic use is not recommended. There is no evidence. Diabetes, fluoxetine has a very good uh, uh, impact on the diabetic control. And these are the medications that we can use if there is hepatic uh, issues, liver issues. Because citalopram, acetylopram, paroxetine, sertraline, they all have half-lives. So not much effect in the metabolism. But fluoxetine, the reason I mentioned earlier, Renal, it's the same. So these are the antidepressants that you can use in special situations. Another important topic, delirium, dementia, psychosis, and antipsychotics. This is a, way, a rough guide that you can uh, differentiate the three conditions. Delirium, quite acute, disorientation, inattention, and uh, that is common in dementia, it's insidious, forgetfulness is there. And then in psychosis, the psychotic symptoms are very well formed, unlike in delirium where they're transient and fleeting. And in psychosis, they are not disoriented most of the time. So that is how you can uh, differentiate roughly uh, between delirium, dementia, and psychosis. So the indications from there, the indications to use antipsychotics are delusions, hallucinations, and agitations. In other words, psychosis. But if a patient is aggressive, uh, very agitated, you could use antipsychotics in that setting as well. So you have to use the lowest possible dose and don't use it as a pure sedative. You can use benzodiazepines, which are safer, and you have to use the half doses in the elderly. These are the antipsychotics that are available. The green ones are available in the uh, garment sector, but even amisulpiride is available, but the stocks are not very, um, uh, they are fluctuating. So it's better not to prescribe amisulpiride in the garment sector because it goes off. And paliperidone, very ex expensive, about 30,000 rupees and available in the private sector as an injection. So these are the side effects. When you take the first generation antipsychotics, the haloperidol, trifluprosine, cardiovascular risks, QT prolongation, hyperprolactinemia, hyponatremia, sexual dysfunction, those are common. SGS, olanzapine, cotapine, clozapine, 
extrapyramidal side effects are not so common, but with risperidone, it is common. The major issue with uh, second generation antipsychotics are the metabolic syndrome, particularly clozapine and olanzapine. Clozapine is anyway not used in the non-psychiatric setting, but olanzapine is used. So you have to check for the comorbidities if you are using olanzapine. Hyponatry, what is important with the neuroleptic malignant syndrome that is seen with the second generation antipsychotics is because the extrapyramidal side effect load is less, the patients present atypically. You would not see the typical neuro neuroleptic malignant syndrome as you see in first generation antipsychotics. So the rigidity might be less, the fever might not be that high, CPK might not be that high, but when things, when the clinical uh, background surrounds it, you have to suspect uh, atypical neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Clozapine, we are always so involved with doing the blood, blood counts because of the agranulocytosis and the neutropenia. But do you know that most of the patients die because of constipation, aspiration, pneumonia, and the cardiac events. Those are the things that we overlook. It can lead to constipation and related paresis, paralysis of the intestinal tract. So that can lead to death rather than the agranulocytosis or the neutropenia. So things that we need to keep in mind because we also don't think of it. Something about antipsychotics in delirium. The management for delirium is correcting the cause. It's not a psychiatric condition. It's a psychiatric delirium manifest in a psychiatric way, but the cause is medical, surgical, neurosurgical, anything other than psychiatric most of the time. Uh, so supportive care, maintaining vital functions is very, very important, and you have to use the minimum doses. Heloperidol starting dose could be 0.75, olanzapine 2.5. If the patient is not taking olanzapine or a dispersible tablets are available, it's better to go for that rather than going for intramuscular injections of heloperidol, which is the only thing that is available in Sri Lanka, because... I am uh, heloperidol, I am injections in a patient who is having delirium, which where there are toxic substances circulating to the brain can cause further uh, complications like leading to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Better to avoid I am uh, heloperidol in patients who are in delirium and antipsychotic knife patients because you are inviting trouble there. Um, when a patient comes with delirium, when there are sleep disturbances, we see benzodiazepines being prescribed, which leads to confusion. The only indication for a patient to be prescribed a benzodiazepines, a patient who is in delirium, is delirium tremens, which is clodazepoxide, or if there are liver problems, oral lorazepam. In all other cases of delirium, it's better to avoid benzodiazepines because it leads to further complications. It might uh, deteriorate the condition by worsening the, worsening the delirium. And you don't have to use uh, antipsychotics in patients. Only there is a behavior, if there is a behavioral disturbance to facilitate investigations, if there is a risk to others, you can use olanzapine, heloperidol, risperidol, cotiapine, small doses. And olanzapine, if the patient is not sleeping in the night, olanzapine is better because it's sedative. But if the patient is having some CNS conditions, better to avoid it because olanzapine reduces the uh, uh, seizure threshold. Just dysphoria is not an indication to start antipsychotics. Undisturbed psychosis, not an indication. I have mentioned about alcohol withdrawal and about the importance of olanzapine. If there are no sleep wake cycle disturbances, but the patient is disturbed, something like heloperidol would be better. So these are the ones recommended, the medication that you can use safely. Epilepsy for perital psychosis, best is to optimize the anti-epileptic medication. But Olanzapine, clozapine, better to avoid because of the reasons I mentioned above. Diabetes, metabolic syndrome, more with clozapine, olanzapine. Cotiapine, moderate risk, 
and haloperidol is better. Uh, haloperidol and risperidone. And hepatic haloperidol, olanzapine, amizalpiride, risperidone, risperidone half the dose. At all cases, it's always better to keep in mind to start with small doses. And renal, again, haloperidol and olanzapine is better. You have to avoid long-acting preparation. Why I mentioned it here is there is a long-acting preparation available in cotypine, which can be administered only once daily, whereas the normal cotypine is administered twice daily. Management of the disturbed patients, I thought I'd mention here because before the psychiatric team come to your ward, you might need some help. If lorazepam is, if the patient is not very agitated, if the patient is taking oral medications, you can use oral medications. These are the um, doses. IM medications, promethazine is very safe. I mean, not 100% safe, but compared to the others, particularly in patients who are having issues and like, you know, who are antipsychotic naive. And you have to monitor the patient because we don't know, particularly in antipsychotic naive patients, what will happen after administering IM medications uh, to disturbance, to control the disturbances. So keeping all that in mind, let's go back to case one. What's the diagnosis? Because the patient has been having depressive symptoms for some time, and this is a planned act, it's a depressive episode. And there was anhedonia and uh, having a poor sleep, and so on. How would imipramine contribute to the seizure? It lowers the seizure threshold. Hyponatremia can cause it. Hypoglycemia, no, because uh, usually imipramine will increase the sugar levels. QT prolongation, unlikely to lead to a uh, seizure. Hypernatremia, usually imipramine would not cause hypernatremia. And going to the case two, The answer is delirium. I put it there because hypoactive delirium is often missed. They think it's depression or they think it's the personality of the patient and the mortality is very high because the patient is not disturbed, not psychotic and is not asking for help. Patients will, uh, without knowing, die uh, without getting correcting. And like these days with hypoxic uh, uh, status that are coming from with the COVID-19, uh, you have to be very, very mindful to know whether a patient is in hypoactive delirium. Because hyperactive delirium, we do not miss it. We do not miss it. But hypoactive delirium, which is most of the time due to metabolic causes, can be missed. And you have to be very, very mindful and actively look for patients. So this is a typical case of hypoactive delirium. This is not depression. So in the presentation today, um, I just touched upon a vast area on how to uh, use psychotropics safely in the non-psychiatric setting and how to choose the appropriate psychotropic that suits the patient because it has to match the patient, the comorbidities and the drugs that the patient is taking plus the condition that the patient is having. And the choice depends on the diagnosis. Like let's say the patient is having bipolar depression you have to prescribe the antidepressant, but you have to cover it up with a mood stabilizer. So it might be better to refer the patient to the psychiatrist, severity and type of symptoms. Like I said, like adjustment disorders, the mild depression do not need antidepressants. And you have to take into consideration the factors like gender, age, employment. A patient who is uh, a teacher cannot afford to be a uh, drowsy in the morning when the patient teaches. So better to avoid olanzapine or better to avoid imipramine uh, in that case. So that's why having a background, in, uh, background knowledge about psychiatric medications and also the fact that it has evolved now a lot. It's not the fluoxetine only, it's not the haloperidol only that we need to know about psychiatry, uh, psychiatric medications and update ourselves. Thank you.